I'm delighted to be to have been invited uh, by the organisers, and uh, uh, I uh, am really uh, absolutely thrilled that this is such a, a successful conference, and uh, uh, I um, am really um, very proud to be able to uh, contribute to it. If um, you would like a copy of the slides uh, that I'm uh, presenting. Uh, just uh, send an email to me. Uh, my email is also uh, get it from the web, uh, and uh, I happily uh, uh, send them to you uh, immediately. Okay, so um, there's a certain amount of anxiety that's associated with uh, evidence-based practice, certainly in England. Um, uh, I don't know uh, whether this picture means anything to you, but uh, really evidence-based practice is not the end of the world. Um, uh, I will try and describe in uh, my talk how we are coping with it in the UK, um, talk honestly about some of the successes and pitfalls uh, of uh, evidence-based practice. But first of all, I'd like to put it into uh, a context that may be as relevant to you here as it's uh, relevant in England. Uh, there's something that's happening for young people uh, in Western societies because <clears throat> since the 1980s, um, there's been an increase, uh, you know, about a doubling of um, uh, prevalence of depression uh, and anxiety. Um, uh, both in girls uh, and boys. There's also been a, a massive increase in parent-rated behavioral problems. Um, although these are flattening, um, these trends are flattening out, but in England certainly we are very concerned that with the financial crisis of uh, the late uh, 2000s, um, uh, it's going to get worse again. Now, if uh, you have to look for causes, and I'm not intending to give, do an analysis here, um, but uh, it's very clear, should be clear to all of us, that young people have a very different life now than the one that uh, we used to have. That the average teenager's day is very different. Uh, from the one they had, um, uh, we had uh, in the 1970s. Well, you, most of you would have had in the 1970s. When you spent most of your day, your average day, uh, was most likely to be at work, uh, certainly in the working hours, and uh, you watched uh, TV, that's the green bit, the unstructured leisure, or listened to music, uh, gramophones, uh, in the evening. Um, and uh, some of us were involved in education, uh, but uh, um, the majority uh, worked. Compare this to the 21st century, where education uh, is uh, much more uh, pervasive, where uh, we spend more time um, during the day watching uh, TV, um, and uh, uh, obviously much, much fewer hours uh, at organized work. So what's happening? Well, if you compare the two, there is decreased work, increased education, uh, and increased sleep, uh, interestingly enough. Um, uh, so 30%, 33% of young people are still asleep uh, at uh, 9 a.m. Uh, compared to only 10% uh, when we were young. 25% uh, of them are asleep by 9.30 p.m. compared to 5% when we were young. That this is um, uh, probably due to a whole range of factors, uh, both the increase in psychopathology and uh, the change in lifestyle. But uh, there is no doubt that they have less external scaffolding, they have increased responsibility for self-development, uh, and uh, in this 
against this background, perhaps it's not surprising uh, that um, there is uh, increased anxiety and increased depression. But there is another context that I want to draw your attention to, um, and that's the recognition of the significance of childhood mental disorders uh, for the rest of the uh, lifespan. And that knowledge is now mediated by uh, our increased understanding of neural development. But uh, that was perhaps uh, the most significant scientific statement about mental health uh, research priorities in Nature published uh, last year uh, that identified improving treatment for children with mental illness as one of the urgent priorities. And uh, uh, there are two components to the arguments that uh, the authors, who were actually the, the great and the good of uh, mental illness, uh, uh, identified. Um, uh, one was uh, the recognition that mental illness is a biggie in terms of disability adjusted life years, that is years uh, that are lost, years disability free that are lost due to uh, mental illness because of death or indeed uh, because uh, of uh, uh, inability and capacity uh, to work and uh, enjoy life. Uh, now, it uh, turns out that uh, uh, this is uh, um, a bigger deal uh, than cancer. It's a bigger deal than uh, cardiovascular disease. Uh, and that 13% globally of the burden of disease falls on mental disorder. Uh, in fact, the large chunk of this uh, is mood disorder um, uh, of various kinds. Um, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder are representing some, but the major, big, the biggest biggie is uh, uh, depression and related to that anxiety. Um, now, this relates obviously to uh, our topic uh, at this conference and your and my lifetime's work, which is uh, the point about the significance of mental disorder in, for children. Um, the report recognizes the particular attention that we need to pay uh, to children um, in terms of prevention and care, and I quote from the report, most mental disorders involve developmental processes, so reducing the duration of treated illness by focusing resources on the earliest definable clinical stage of illness could revolutionize uh, treatment. Indeed, we now know that 75% of psychopathology uh, in 26 to 29 year olds is already evident uh, in under 18, uh, mostly by 15. Um, and we need to pay attention uh, to this because we understand now that the longer the brain functions in a particular way, the more difficult that brain will find it to change. And obviously the poor outcomes from the treatment of depression uh, in adulthood uh, is uh, an indication uh, of the truth of that. But the report also suggests that we need to pay attention to risk factors, things that we know uh, cause mental disorder in children and young people, and make an effort to build positively mental capital, enhance factors such as uh, resilience. So there is now, amongst those who are seeing this World Health Organization uh, and that other global bodies, United Nations, a general recognition just how important our work as child and adolescent mental health professionals is. So this is the general commitment, but how does this um, uh, translate 
to something. In the UK government, uh, in the document No Health Without Mental Health, the Secretary of State uh, comments by promoting good mental health and intervening early, particularly in childhood and teenage years, we can help prevent mental illness from developing and mitigate its effect when it does. So the words are wonderful. The wind is blowing from behind us. But I'm not sure what the situation is in Sweden, but in the United Kingdom, there is a significant disconnect between what is intellectually, socially, by policymakers recognized to be good practice and what actually is happening on the ground. The first level to look at is perhaps life satisfaction. Um, the, amongst 15 year olds collected by the World Health Organization that shows that uh, England uh, is, amongst 15 year olds, uh, about 75 to 79 percent would say that they are, uh, have high life satisfaction. It's about the same as in Sweden. It's about average for Europe. But that's where the similarity between the, our two countries ends. When you take a deeper look at well-being, uh, measured in terms of uh, economic, health, and educational data, uh, as well as the responses of children and young people, uh, about friendships, about family, about risk-taking behaviors, about enjoyment in schools, as well as life satisfaction. Uh, we see a distinct difference in the uh, position of the United Kingdom and Sweden. We are at the very bottom of uh, the International League, and you guys are at the top or at least second on it, the Netherlands. So there's something that you're doing right that we are doing desperately wrong. So why am I here? <laughs> why aren't you guys coming to lecture us? Um, um, well, uh, maybe I'm here to... Uh, show you uh, how you can perhaps turn some things around or to at least try to. Um, and if you're doing things well to start with, maybe there's no room for improvement. Anyway, um, the, uh, uh, in the last 10 years, the British government has spent a considerable amount of uh, money in increasing uh, child and health and mental health services. Um, and uh, funding was increased by 62% um, between 2003 and 2007 with additional monies that are uh, for inpatient care and young offenders uh, that are not even included in that. Nevertheless, um, when you look at uh, the, this in the context of the total spending on healthcare within the United Kingdom, which is uh, 110 billion. Um, all mental disorders uh, spend about 10% of that. It's a little less than it should, given that the disability adjusted life is more like 13 to 14%, 14% in the UK actually. But uh, uh, of that uh, 10%, Child and adolescent mental disorders represent 5%. Actually, that graph is a bit deceptive. If I was actually going to draw what that figure corresponds to, you wouldn't be able to see it. Um, uh, it's about half of 1% of health spending in the UK is on child and adolescent uh, mental disorders. But does this make any kind of sense if we can help mental illness from developing and if mental illness truly represents a, a major component of uh, uh, disability uh, that humans suffer globally? But the reality of delivering or disseminating evidence-based care is actually a financial reality that is 
in the UK at least, far from attractive. The coalition government expects parity of esteem between mental and uh, physical health services. And the rising demand uh, in the NHS means that the NHS has to find up to about 20 billion in efficiency savings by 2014. So nearly 11% of England's annual secondary care health budget is allocated uh, to mental health, and therefore we will have to uh, take our share of this. So it becomes extremely important that we are responsible in the way we spend these resources, these shrinking resources, and we spend them in the most cost-effective way possible. So what's the national health context for disseminating an evidence base? Well, uh, the financial context is actually quite interesting. Uh, a, a particular initiative uh, improved access uh, in, uh, psychological, uh, to psychological therapies um, uh, was initiated by Lord Layard uh, in uh, 2006, showing that effective treatment of anxiety and depression would pay for itself in terms of uh, increased uh, capacity to uh, work made an explicit economic case for psychological therapies. And uh, for once, uh, policymakers and government took this seriously. A similar case was then made uh, for child and young people's mental health services. Um, and uh, uh, with Raf Calvin and Anne York, a business case was put to government. And the bid to support improved access to psychological therapies in the UK was funded in 2010 uh, as a pilot uh, for uh, eight million uh, pounds a year uh, to develop this service uh, for four years. Um, and I will tell you, as a national clinical advisor to this service, I will describe uh, in a minute what we have done. Um, but um, uh, this has to be seen in the context of, of uh, how much was spent on adult uh, improved access to psychological therapies, which is 100 million uh, per, uh, per year uh, over the same spending period. So what's the policy context uh, for this? There's a new mental health strategy in the uh, UK, which is taking a live course approach and is quality driven. The NHS uh, is now going to be uh, functioning in terms of an outcomes framework um, and um, uh, commissioning of mental health uh, care will be in terms of these quality indicators, outcomes indicators. Um, providing data uh, to support quality and choice uh, and the IT infrastructure to support it, as well as ensuring choice for patients has become uh, key, uh, the, the key uh, set of principles. So uh, what uh, um, uh, we have uh, been trying to achieve, the framework for child and young people's improved access to psychological therapy is consistent, is synergic with government policy. It links directly to um, a, a payment by results structure, where payment for services will be linked to uh, the particular clusters of disorders that are being treated. Uh, and we are linked in uh, uh, with this uh, protocol. Also, uh, I should mention that uh, uh, the child health outcome strategy is led by the same group of people as are, are, are leading the uh, uh, Improved Access to Psychological Therapies program. And finally, uh, the Department of Education has developed a, uh, a 
integration of voluntary sector providers into, uh, particularly school counsellors, into uh, this system, and I will uh, uh, discuss this in a moment. So um, this gets, gets us to the challenge of my talk, the talk about dissemination, the gap between research and practice. Research, how things are done, what we know, what the truth is, as the child, uh, the video uh, has said, and in practice, the truth of practice, how things are actually done on the ground. And the sad fact is that there is a massive gap between best evidence on the one hand and clinical practice on the other. Letting things happen by themselves if there is no attempt at implementing, if there is no implementation team, if there is no organization that's responsible for implementing evidence at practice level, the success rates are low, 14%, and it takes an incredible amount of time. The average time between what's called a bench to bedside, that is the laboratory discovery and its implementation in clinical practice is actually 17 years, which is uh, unfortunate. Um, the effective use of implementation science can dramatically reduce this uh, and increase success rates uh, at the same time. Um, now, a great example of the problems uh, but also perhaps the solution is uh, uh, our uh, children and uh, young people uh, collaboratives, which I will, uh, will talk about uh, towards the end of my talk. But before, uh, I'd like to acquaint you with the depressing story of antidepressants. Um, now, first some data from uh, the US Centers from uh, Disease Control uh, and Prevention on the uh, 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 prevalence of antidepressants. Antidepressant use in the United States has increased 400% between 1988 and 2008. And now 11% of those 12 years or older are currently taking antidepressants. Now, if you look at this, uh, by symptom severity. Uh, it's uh, very interesting that uh, it's about less than 10% of those with no depression, fortunately, but almost 20% of those with mild and 30% of those with moderate depression uh, are taking antidepressants. Now, we also know that Antidepressants within the none to moderate range are probably ineffective. The threshold of clinical significance for antidepressants is probably a, a Hamilton depression rating score of uh, about 25. Actually, a, a study by Kirsch puts it uh, much higher, more about 28. But what you can see uh, from this uh, uh, diagram, which didn't, slide, didn't quite work, I'm sorry about that, uh, it's kind of shifted between computers. Um, uh, but uh, what we uh, uh, now know is that for uh, individuals uh, who are uh, on antidepressants, if you are uh, uh, mild to moderate depressed, there is no difference. The difference arises not because drug effects become greater with uh, severe depression, but placebo effects are reduced. Adding to this, what we know in the literature is not all there is to know, is not the truth. And I'll be coming back to this theme. Uh, again and again. This study that we did in, the, uh, uh, in 2004 compared public knowledge, published literature, with unpublished knowledge on antidepressants. And it turned out 
that whilst fluoxetine was supported, uh, Prozac, was supported in its efficacy by unpublished studies, uh, sertraline, uh, paroxetine uh, had equivocal effects, and uh, citalopram and venlafaxine had unfavorable risk-benefit profiles when you also considered the unpublished studies. This, actually, I'm proud to say, won uh, the Lancet Paper of the Year in 2004. I won't bother reading you the uh, citation, although it gives me great pleasure. Um, uh, but uh, uh, it had enormous implications, including the black boxing of antidepressants in the, in the US. And it's the only time I've ever did anything that made the front page of the New York Times. Uh, I've been waiting for the next time, but uh, it has not happened. So uh, uh, this is the depressing aspect uh, of uh, evidence-based practice, of looking at the literature, that there is much that's unpublished that's not there uh, which might tell a different story. But there is a NICE story. Now, NICE stands for um, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, which in the UK is responsible for identifying uh, looking at the evidence for what works. Um, we wrote a couple of books uh, some time ago uh, called What Works for Whom, and uh, uh, the um, second, uh, the, the What Works for Whom for uh, Children and Adolescents, the uh, second edition is almost with the publishers. Um, I'm just drawing this to your attention in case you are interested. Um, anyway, but, but the point here is that what we look at are the quality of the evidence for linking treatment to outcome in a causal way. How certain can we be that what is claimed for a treatment can actually uh, be um, uh, effective? Now, my how I'm talking about this because it doesn't, the fact that something is evidence based doesn't mean that it will work for you. It means that it could work for you. But we need to put, as you will hear me say, another set of mechanisms in place to ensure that it does. It does not reduce the need uh, for the evaluation of outcome locally. So um, uh, why do people need to get together uh, uh, like this to review the evidence base? Well, let me just give you one example uh, from uh, uh, the uh, Tordia trial uh, of uh, switching uh, uh, to SSRI or to venlafaxine with or without cognitive behavior therapy, having had a failed treatment uh, with uh, antidepressants. Uh, uh, so it's a, an SSRI-resistant depression. Uh, the conclusion from this trial was that for adolescents with depression, not responding to an adequate initial treatment with an SSRI, the combination of cognitive behavioral uh, and a switch to another antidepressant resulted in a higher rate of clinical response than did a medication switch alone. However, a switch to another SSRI was just as efficacious uh, as a switch to venlafaxine and resulted in fewer adverse effects. So basically it's saying that if you add CBT to this switch, it'll increase the likelihood of effects. And indeed there is, uh, and you look at the uh, uh, percent of responders in, in this study, you find that uh, in uh, those who uh, uh, had CBT, um, uh, uh, then uh, uh, these are the uh, right, uh, uh, the dark uh, uh, green lines on the, on the right-hand side. They did better than those without CBT, but SSRI and venlafaxine as, uh, uh, did not uh, uh, make a, any difference. They intend to treat sample and completers uh, always tend to show uh, slight differences uh, like that. But it looks like it's a, it's a substantial 
benefit from CBT uh, in this case. However, when you look at the continuous measures, self-report measures of depression, can anybody see a difference between those two lines, between CBT and no CBT? Because I sure as hell can't. Um, suicidal ideation, similarly, doesn't seem that different to me. It seems actually more or less overlapping. Uh, what about the global assessment scale? Again, nothing. So what about this uh, conclusion that uh, the combination of cognitive behavior therapy and the switch to another is uh, result in higher rate of clinical response than medication switch alone? Well, there is a little sentence hidden away in the paper that says, there were no differential treatment effects on scalar measures of depression, suicidal ideation, and functioning, nor were there treatment effects on suicide attempts or self-harm. In fact, it was a negative result. So actually, you do need a bunch of people who are going to look at this evidence and study it and convey from it uh, what actually can be thought of as truth. People who are disinterested in uh, uh, the results uh, and are, are, are honors brokers. So uh, NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Science, are made up of such honors brokers. Um, and uh, I uh, uh, have uh, uh, summarized on a single slide the entire set of conclusions from NICE guidelines. This, this is actually a, a, a remarkable feat of uh, parsimony, uh, but, uh, I, um, uh, but these, these are the current, uh, uh, current guidance. Um, I, I'm not uh, particularly uh, 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 wanting to emphasize any, any part of this, but you'll see there is uh, a lot of evidence for CBT in different contexts, but by no means all. Uh, so for example, in the case of depression, so variety of therapies uh, uh, that, uh, that work um, and are recommended. Um, and uh, uh, in, um, uh, uh, in fact, for depression, not, there wasn't a dynamic psychotherapy is recommended for um, anorexia as well as uh, for depression uh, in, in, uh, by NICE and that may be expanded. Um, there is an apparent disadvantage to dynamic uh, approaches uh, because uh, there have been fewer studies. But I'm, I'm willing to accept that that's anything whatsoever to do with the methodology. So for example, Trudy Russo has uh, recently uh, completed a trial of uh, mentalization-based treatment for adolescents who self-harm where she showed a significant effect from a psychodynamic treatment uh, over a 12-month period on reducing self-harm, where CBT, DBT, MSC, and a range of other treatments have not been shown to have uh, uh, good outcomes. It's a question of performing the trials and finding disorders for which uh, a particular treatment uh, may be effective. There is a bumper crop of evidence-based psychotherapies out there. There are 175 uh, therapies listed on the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration uh, website. There are systematic reviews, meta-analyses, there are influential websites, there are major reports that uh, uh, recommend uh, these things, and you um, um, have uh, your own uh, guidance uh, as well. Uh, what's the problem uh, with it, or what are some of the challenges? They all focus on specific problems uh, or disorders. They retain focus on those, uh, these treatments all retain focus on those problems throughout the treatment, and they tend to focus a fairly well-developed uh, but somewhat fixed protocol. They reflect decades of work by clinical sci clinician scientists trying to improve their treatments to shape them so that they are at their most effective. And it does contain within it the wish, at least, to move 
clinical interventions in child and adolescent mental health from an art to a science. Evidence-based therapies have better outcomes relative to a range of controls. Uh, they have medium to large uh, effect sizes. Um, the child literature is somewhat less mature than the adult literature. Um, and in the child literature, a very small proportion of trials, probably now more like 10%, involve treatment of normally referred youngsters in clinical service settings administered by practitioners. There are recent effectiveness trials that compare evidence-based practices with usual care uh, under everyday clinical conditions, which show smaller effects uh, than uh, the initial uh, studies uh, used to be. And so this, for example, looking at depression studies across the years, what you find is that between 1985 and 2005, the uh, effect size of evidence-based therapies for depression, for CBT for depression in 27 has decreased markedly. Uh, now, there are a whole range of reasons for this, and uh, 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 I don't want to uh, uh, alight on this, but it does uh, raise the question of uh, the need to overview evidence uh, for um, evidence for evidence-based psychotherapies in general. What is the evidence for uh, evidence-based treatment? Well, there are about 500 randomized trials um, of psychotherapy with participants uh, with uh, a diagnosis or with elevated symptoms. Most of these studies compare uh, the psychotherapy to a waiting list or no treatment or no alternative treatment. Around 40 of these studies compare evidence-based psychotherapies to usual care. Evidence-based psychotherapies outperform usual care at, with an effect size of about 0.3, which means 60% uh, are better than those receiving usual care. Now, this may be uh, as, you may consider this as a small effect size, but the impact of this would be large if translated into a large-scale shift from usual care to the widespread use of evidence-based uh, treatment. But some qualifications are in order. I'll just alight on these briefly. Um, are we... Uh, concerned uh, with improvement in symptoms alone? What is the structure within which the treatment is administered? What about delayed effects? What about the significance of diagnosis? What about the informant source? And uh, when you look at uh, evidence-based practice, these are uh, this is cognitive behavior therapy and usual clinical care for youth depression. Uh, EBP does not seem to be uh, very much superior to usual care. However, if you're not using symptom scores as the outcome, but the length of the treatment, the quality of therapeutic alliance, or the use of additional services, or cost, then evidence-based alternatives are superior, or is certainly, in this case, was superior. The second issue is uh, 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 the context. In the ADAPT trial of, uh, this is the largest randomized trial, one of the large randomized trials of uh, treatment uh, uh, resistance uh, depression, uh, fluoxetine was uh, compared, no, sorry, fluoxetine was administered, uh, but in some cases, uh, cognitive behavior therapy uh, was also uh, used. In others, uh, it was 
simply uh, a specialist clinical care. Now, you can see again there was no difference between the two approaches. CBT apparently added nothing to specialist clinical care. However, when you look at what the nature of that specialist clinical care was, uh, the specialist clinical care included sleep hygiene, psychoeducation, problem solving, a structured protocol, uh, behavioral activation, a whole range of components of uh, what would have been a psychotherapy. So uh, it is obviously the case that treatment as usual differs uh, across uh, a number of uh, different trials. Some trials, you have to look at what it is being compared with before you con conclude that something is or is not evidence-based uh, in terms of uh, the size of uh, the, uh, the effect. I would say also important is how long after the end of treatment you look. Most uh, treatments actually increase, some, not all, but increase in effectiveness as you look further away from the uh, end of treatment. So in the ADAP trial, for example, the maximum clinical benefits were seen 28 weeks after the treatment began. But there are uh, some moderators uh, of uh, treatment effectiveness, such as the location of the study. Now, this actually surprises me. Uh, it turns out that um, in studies in the United States report larger effect sizes compared to treatment as usual than studies performed elsewhere. Now, the reason for this is be perhaps because uh, el studies performed elsewhere have less effective implementations of uh, therapies developed in the United States, or maybe treatment as usual is better elsewhere than in the United States. Um, the method of recruitment, which was used to, used to be thought to be uh, quite important uh, in determining effect size, does not appear to moderate it compared to treatment as usual. So referred, recruited, or non-voluntary patients have insignificantly different uh, size of effects. Similarly, the length of uh, follow-up, uh, publication year, the developmental period, internal versus externalizing disorders, modality, uh, that is youth-focused or parent and family-focused or multisystemic or inpatient residential, uh, outpatient, appears to make no difference in terms of the size of the effect compared to treatment as usual. The informant, however, does make a difference. If the young person or the parent is informant, the effect size appears much larger than if it's someone like a teacher or indeed the therapist. The therapist seems to actually see much bigger changes in treatment as usual than in evidence-based uh, therapies. No, much bigger, but uh, significantly bigger. Uh, now, this could be because they're invested in the treatment as usual, uh, less invested in uh, evidence-based practice. But when you ask the young person, they do see the difference. When you ask the parent, they are more likely to see the difference. The presence of a DSM diagnosis also makes a difference. If you're looking at uh, studies where all the participants had a DSM diagnosis, the effect sizes compared to treatment as usual are much smaller. So, uh, now such is so much of data uh, for now. Uh, what about the practical challenges of uh, rolling out evidence-based practice? In reality, children and young people out there have multiple problems. Some evidence-based psychotherapies are successful in dealing with individuals with multiple problems. But some 
uh, are single problem focused. And uh, uh, that doesn't mean that they are less effective. We have seen that they are slightly more effective than treatment as usual. But they need adaptation. It faces you with a practical problem. Also, if you're, the kids that you see are the same as mine, uh, the ones that I see, rather than my own children who also have mental health problems, but I'm not willing to talk about those. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 as one treats these young people, their treatment needs change. It's not what they started with. So you adopt an evidence-based approach, but then the treatment need shifts on you. There are also massive axis four problems uh, in uh, our clinical load, ecological, social, family challenges. There are, oh, okay. There are uh, crises uh, that need to be dealt with. Uh, there are uh, issues of uh, 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 standards of uh, care. Clinicians require expertise in a number of uh, evidence-based protocols, and that can create a, 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 a learning challenge. I would also say uh, that the coordination of all this actually presents uh, a substantial uh, problem. It requires uh, an evolution uh, to move from a, an efficacy trial to implementation. It needs an improvement in strategies for training, changes in protocol design, and an overhaul in uh, service management. So just very briefly, what did we do? Um, in our program, we uh, decided uh, to uh, aim at uh, uh, improving the entire uh, service, the entire child health and mental health service, to make bring evidence-based transformation to the service at a change of culture level. We wanted to change the philosophy to cause a lasting long-term uh, change, rooted in quality, uh, building on what the adult uh, uh, improved access to psychosocial therapy uh, people did, but actually also going uh, in a quite a different way. We wanted to create a project that reflected the needs of the clients and the professionals. And for that, you needed drivers at the individual level, at the organizational and system level, and you need leadership. At the individual level, uh, you need a selection of therapists to be trained in particular uh, modalities, who then need, whose training then needs to be supported in supervision and coaching. At the organizational drivers, you need a decision support data system that will support evidence-based practice. You need a facility of administration, and you need systems, uh, interventions. You need the way that the whole system delivers care to change, and you need performance assessment at all levels to assure fidelity, but then the child and family benefit. And these were the principles of uh, Child and Young People's Iron. Uh, the project principles uh, were included designing it in relation to the young people, uh, learning from adult IAP, but not accepting everything that they did, uh, training at the heart of it, training uh, for staff in curricula approved of therapies approved by NICE, evidence-based therapies, mandating the collection of outcome uh, framework, uh, high frequency session by session levels of uh, outcomes monitoring, the use of technology for improving access to evidence-based mental health support and intervention for users, and involving children and young people uh, at all levels uh, in the project, in planning it as well as in local evaluation. Um, we needed to enhance the capability of services to deliver 
uh, uh, consultation, outreach, uh, training, support staff. So it's a, a complete overhaul of the system. So what, were, what was driving this? What is driving this is uh, um, higher education institutions who are working in partnership with uh, service providers, voluntary service providers, uh, NHS service providers, and commissioners of services to assure quality, to organize training, to deliver content in partnerships. Creating these learning collaboratives where they support each other has turned out to be essential. And we take on more partnerships each year with uh, past partnerships uh, 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 becoming uh, mentors uh, uh, in, in the program. Um, these are the year one collaboratives which I won't bore you with, but I do want to say that regular meetings between these and developing of a website, training supervisors, and uh, uh, handbooks for supervisors, all these turned out to be incredibly important. One final thing uh, that I uh, want to emphasize, none of this would last beyond, you'd be a demonstrate and die. In order to make it sustain, we need to engage the professions uh, in it. And uh, those services that move over to uh, an, uh, an IAPT model, an evidence-based model, are, will be accredited. And we developed an accreditation steering group uh, for the courses that we provide, for the individuals who are being trained, and for the services in order to assure quality and long-term legacy. And in this, a whole range of professional groups have signed up uh, to support uh, this structure. Um, let me just end uh, with a warning. I've talked about uh, a great number uh, of uh, uh, facts or truths. Uh, but Evidence-based practice is not an excuse for mindlessness. We have to make meaning. As Henri Poincaré pointed out, science is built up with facts as a house is with stone. But a collection of facts is no more a science than a heap of stones is a house. Evidence is what we feel is worth knowing. Um, uh, now, this is some evidence as a psychoanalyst that I feel is worth knowing. Uh, these are mortality rates for three white male groups as a function of age. Oops. Uh, uh, um, if you look at uh, white males, uh, after the age 50, there is a rapid increase in mortality. I apologize for this. It's not my fault. Uh, uh, it's a fact. However, if you are medically trained, this is dramatically reduced. However, if you are a psychoanalyst. <laughs> so obviously, psychoanalysis is the treatment of choice for life. <laughs> I leave you with that factlet. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Stay on. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter, for a very inspirational and uh, inspiring talk. We struggle with the same things here. And uh, well, I thank you very much. You, you get a flower. And as everyone else, you get a toy. It's a uh, mechanic mouse to bring back to, to the oh, UK. Thank you very much.